slideshow. So <laughs> we're gonna have an amazing and uh, incredible afternoon together. For those that I don't know, my name is Andy Bird. next to you and around you. This is a room full of legends, full of amazing people, and we've all come together because of Brian Brent and how amazing his life was. And today's going to be full of tears, I'm sure. I think it's also going to be full of laughter and uh, different moments. You know, I think Brian, if uh, he were here with us, would of course love and respect the, the honor and the sobriety, but also would find a way to, in a way, destroy the sobriety of it and to make sure that we, uh, we didn't get too traditional. So in honor of Brian, would you give someone a high five next to you? Tell them that you're glad that they're here. Today we have the great privilege of celebrating the life of Brian Brent. We celebrate the glory of God in and through this man's life. Today we're reminded that in death is eternal life for the saints. And then in the celebration of Brian's life, we're reminded of the significance of our own lives, laid down in wholehearted obedience to Christ. Nothing would make Brian happier than to know that we gathered together in his passing and that we loved each other radically and that we worshiped wholeheartedly. So I want to invite you to stand this, uh, this afternoon and um, we're going to start in the most appropriate way possible by giving glory to God, even in the midst of loss. We're gonna give so much glory to Jesus today. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your presence here. We feel your tangible presence among us. We thank you that in moments like this, your presence is so near to each one of us. We know that days like today, they're a mystery to those that don't have faith. But to those of us in the room, days like today are glorious. There are moments that mark us for the rest of our lives. And as we honor Brian, we pray also that you would mark our lives today. One of the most catalytic men that any of us had ever met, that even in his passing, he would catalyze us to love you more, to worship more extravagantly. So Jesus, we just declare that today you get all the glory. All the glory goes to you, Jesus, even in loss. You get the glory, Jesus. We love you. You get all the glory, Jesus. You get all the honor. You get all the praise. And all the saints and angels, they bow. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Only Jesus. For from you are all things. And to you are all 
do one more song this afternoon. <clears throat> Many of you would know the YWAM word of ways of young people hitting the nations and Brian grabbed a hold of that word 
with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can see it in all the young people in this room that are a wave of young people. And so his daughter, Chloe, wrote a song to articulate this prophetic word. And I want us to sing another wave today with some fire. Is that okay? Come on. Sing this with me. Here comes another wave of revival. Can you feel the earth shaking? Oh, the time is now begun. Here comes another wave of revival. Can you feel the earth? It's shaking. It's shaking. I know the time.
We say you are good and your love endures forever. You are good and your love endures forever, Jesus. One more time, sing he's worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. In for from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Amen. We thank you, Jesus. We give you glory and honor and praise. Just lift up a shout to Jesus in this place. Lord, we just welcome a spirit of prophecy in this gathering even. We just welcome, even in the grief, we welcome the glory and the joy of the Lord in this gathering as we celebrate one of the most amazing men any of us have ever met. Would you fill us with faith? Would you fill us with joy? And of course, you allow us to grieve as well. Lord, we just thank you. All of these emotions are present today. And Lord, let today be a catalytic spark to the future. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, that was so appropriate to sing that. I don't know if you guys noticed that uh, the program here, also very appropriate, if this looks familiar to you because it looks exactly like a Rocky poster. Rocky was one of Brian's favorite movies and it is so appropriate that Rocky is on this flyer today. But I have the privilege of just sharing a few words with you today as one of Brian's closest friends. And um, we're also going to get to hear from some amazing friends and, of course, the family today. And uh, as I said before, be yourselves this afternoon. Circuit riders, be your wild, exuberant selves. And uh, as we hear from people, feel free to celebrate what they share. Feel free to celebrate throughout this afternoon as we just honor this amazing man. And I just want to read a few thoughts to you today. There's glory and there's grief in the death of the saints. For the earth, a loss. For heaven and for Brian, tremendous gain. No more suffering, no more pain, no more sickness. Today, we feel the grief of our loss and at the same time, the glory of his gain. And we feel heaven's nearness on us all. We feel the grief and the void that his tremendous voice, his leadership, his laughter, his incredible, larger-than-life personality, his endless snack deliveries, his cake purchases, his love for steak, his generosity, his subtle backdoor confrontations that changed most of us in the room, and his incredible encouragement. We miss Brian. We miss him. At the same time, we can already feel the miracle of redemption rising like a massive wave in all of those that will carry his message, who are marked by his life, who will be catalyzed in his death into another level of love and obedience. Death thins the veil between heaven and earth. We peer a little closer. Life feels a little shorter and a little more precious. Eternity becomes a little more real. These are the sacred opportunities that we can't create on our own. To both celebrate a man who changed our lives and is now in glory, and to recognize that a baton has been passed that must not be dropped. Hebrews 11 reminds us that faith is both present in the moment, but is also directly connected to the future and to future generations. The kingdom is a multi-generational uh, breakthrough. And breakthrough is only as significant as it is carried forward from one generation to the next. Brian has run his race. Today, we carry the race forward. This baton must not be dropped. And there is only one possible outcome, and that is victory. When I think of Brian's life, I think of uh, Philippians 1.21, for to live is Christ, to die is gain. And you think of Brian's life and... Every ounce of him was to live as Christ. And, and for him, he has done nothing but gain. Brian has approached the unapproachable light. He is in splendor right now and in glory. 
And uh, when I think of that passage, you know, Paul declaring for me to live every day as Christ, I think of all that Brian endured. And it seemed like the sicker he became, the more determined he became to see, see the kingdom spread. And his sickest days were some of his most tenacious days. If you were around him on some of those sick days, you just had to watch out. Because he was going to catalyze something, he was going to birth something, someone was going to get saved, someone was going to find their calling. But for Brian, the closer he felt to possibly losing his life and his health, the more determined he became to see the kingdom of God spread across the earth. And I think about once he was in the hospital, in and out for the last four or five months, just like Paul imprisoned near the end of his life, Brian wrote his own epistles and hundreds of text messages that many of us in this room received and voice texts writing from the prison of his hospital bed, but still contending in faith for breakthrough. How many in this room received a text or a voice text in the last four or five months where you knew the man was in his hospital bed, but he was still thinking more about us than he even was about his own life? Well, it can be said today that Brian has fought the good fight. He has finished the race. He's kept the faith, and he is now, right now, wearing his crown of righteousness. There's a passage that so speaks to the moment we're in right now. It's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 through 58. It says of Brian, when the perishable has been closed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's worth celebrating today. Brian has stepped into that victory. Death has no sting. Jesus has overcome the grave, and therefore Brian has overcome death and stepped into the glory of eternal life right now. And oh, that we would allow that revelation to touch our hearts today of the nearness of eternity. That passage goes on and it speaks to us who would remain. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that in your labor, that, the, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So today we honor Brian, we celebrate him, a life well lived, faithful, zealous, and poured out. And to us, I feel like as one of Brian's closest friends outside of his family, what might he say to us, and this is at least what I think he might say, onward, Christian soldier. There is work to be done. A Jesus movement in this generation. 200,000 new missionaries in the nations of the earth. Brave love women rising across the earth as messengers. Black voices leading and proclaiming across the nation. Missions music singing go to an entire generation. Media that inspires and activates the masses and an army of unoffended, courageous-hearted, faith-filled, fully surrendered, servant-hearted leaders that will change the earth and never, ever forgetting to stop for the one in front of us. This is Brian's legacy, and it's God's glory. On a personal level, just last moment here, Brian was the toughest human I have ever met. Think of all the times we had long flights together to places like Singapore, across Europe. We went to South Africa once for 24 hours and came home. The same to Colombia. Endless hours in LA traffic on our way to Pasadena for another 21 project or a training school. Late night meetings again and again, far beyond what I could have endurance for hours of intercession for someone's breakthrough, a movement, a ministry that went late into the night, all while sick. In the rare moments that he would open up to me and share about the realities of his illness and he would describe the real pain he was in, it was unimaginable to me. Much younger, much healthier, and completely exhausted. And there he was, never 
ever giving up. His capacity, his, his lung capacity reduced, extreme chest pain, joint pain, sleeplessness. But I just want to say, let's be honest, in the movement of the circuit riders and the birth of this, we studied the heroes that started this in history. And it just needs to be said once and for all that Brian was the true Francis Asbury among us. <laughs> the toughest man we know. Enduring to the end in faithfulness and look at the fruit of his life in this room. I think few people have ever been able to gather so many leaders in the body of Christ and so many 18-year-olds at the body of Christ at the same time. This is Brian's legacy and God's glory. Amen. We're going to hear in a moment... We're going to hear in a moment from some of Brian's closest friends and heroes. And first, um, Lou Engel often said that Brian was the adrenaline gland to the body of Christ. But what Lou didn't always know is that Lou Engel was adrenaline to Brian Brent. These two were cut from the same cloth. The endurance, the grit, they shared a common love for the difficulty and the glory of breakthrough. Fought in the trenches for many, many wars. And I think one of Brian's greatest, most fondest memories, though maybe one of the hardest seasons, was a 40-day fast at USC where Brian and Christy moved into a closet right next to Lou. And for 40 days, warred for a breakthrough in America that would lead to Azusa Now and so many other things. So would you guys welcome one of Brian's heroes, Lou Engel, to come and share with us. Thank you. I decided I'd wear blue. Because I'm just identifying with Brian in the heavenly realms. Hallelujah. Thank you, Christy, and your family for allowing me to, to share my deep honor of this great man and deep honor of a family. Not many people make me jealous. <laughs> Brian provoked the heck out of me. <laughs> how does he do that? You know, I was, I was thinking uh, that there's this quote that says, life does not consist in the number of breaths that you take, but in the breaths that take, uh, the, uh, but in the moments that take your breath away. I think every moment with Brian took our breath away. You couldn't, you couldn't help be ignited by the fire and his faith. I mean, when he came into my living room with those dwarves, as I've said before, and he said, 80 million souls, 200,000 laborers. Yeah. I, I, I had no faith for that. But I had faith because Brian had faith. Now I'm believing it. I, 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 the scripture I was thinking about this morning about Brian Brent, you know, from the days of Brian Brent, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. I'm looking at the violent. It's called violent love. Violent action, violent activity in the spirit. He took our breath away. And I think he ran so hard that he couldn't breathe anymore. Oh, I tell you, he's breathing the breath of heaven today. And I have a feeling that there are some people, when they die, heaven is moved at that ascendancy and maybe the breath of the greatest revival known to man. I, this is not hype. I believe this, that a man can be held in such high esteem by heaven that heaven has to act. I believe that for Brian. I think of other moments that took her breath away, sitting around a swimming pool in Orlando. I mean, come on. What, what can you get done around a swimming pool in Orlando? And Brian starts talking to me about Ekbalo 
And suddenly our swimming pool, we begin to swim in an understanding and revelation. Can I tell you, my daughter is on the way to a major city in Iraq, in Iraq today because Brian's word of Iqbal. She's there carrying the gospel because of a word that he delivered from a team of companies that were like mini adrenaline glands. My daughter is in Iraq today in the middle of a neighborhood of Kurdish people that have made her home their home. Their kids stay there all day long. Thank you, Brian, for hurling forth my daughter into the harvest fields. I, 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 think, I think of those amazing moments, that 40-day fast, what insanity <laughs> that Christy, by the way, Christy, you, 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 you two are just, when you talk about Brian, you gotta talk about Christy. You, you just have to, I mean, 35 years. I once read a, a, a word that said, when a man on a sickbed refuses to die and makes the wheels of hell grind hard through his prayers. You've made the wheels of, hair, uh, uh, of hell grind hard. And I just wanna prophesy. I believe you're stepping into your Joy Dawson moment. I, I, I believe that Brian would say to you, woman, burn, woman, explode. Turn this nation back to God. You know, so people say, well, he was a great man. He was a great man of God. Some say this, show me, her, show me his wife. He was a great man. By the way, that same passage that says wisdom, wisdom is vindicated by her children. Here's your vindication, Brian. Here's your, here's your vindication. I'll never forget when you busted out that wave of revival. So I about flew out of my skin. Seriously. I'll never forget. Nick, listen, the statesmanship, the character of your life. But you gave me a voice in Carmel. I love filming with Andrew. I think the guy's name is. And maybe he's here. But, you know, it is so easy to film with those dudes. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, did you get that? <laughs> uh, just, I'm, I'm just so grateful for your, for your amazing lives. Beating the drums, character, married, hallelujah. On and on, the people that you're marrying, the young guys with character and light. They are your vindication, Brian. I'll say it to you right now because I believe you're in the great cloud of witness. These are your vindication and the circuit riders are your vindication. They vindicate your life and lifestyle. I'm very gripped. Uh, if I could read this. I wrote, I wrote something. Oh, no, it just went off. Oh, help me, Lord. These things are... <laughs> When I heard that Brian died, my family, my little, my daughter exploded into tears. Therese exploded into tears. And um, he's a, such an instrument of revival. He moved all of us. He loved me deeply. And I wrote this e e e e email and Chloe read it. Now, it may sound like this is about me, but it isn't. This, this thing touched maybe one of the greatest e texts I've ever received in my whole life. Thank you, Chloe. She said, if I can find it. Thank you so much for these words, Chloe said. The tears are flowing, so are mine. There's so much to remember. When we lived in Tacoma, I watched you on YouTube and started praying daily that you would become my dad's friend. <laughs> I wanted to him, I, I wanted him to have one friend that was just as wild as he was. <laughs> I'm still trying to catch up with Brian. I prayed for only one year, and my mom ran after your car in the IHOP parking lot. <laughs> and ha ha to your first visit to Kona, where we yelled, come with us. 
It's one of those moments that take your breath away. You were a gift to my dad. He wrestled at times. Oh, no, I missed something. And to the 40 days at USC, boy, will we ever forget that night, Lindy. All oh, those jam-packed Mondo's room. And by the way, there, I think there's four or five Ekbalo houses of prayer wow. that are praying laborers into the harvest field oh, because wow. of Brian. And who knows how many others. He said, uh, you were a gift to my dad. He wrestled at times over the large words Jesus would give, but he met someone who believed to the same degree he did. Well, maybe not, but he was a big dreamer. Great leaders give articulation to that which is being groaned in the masses. It releases mass movements. He gave articulation. He gave faith. Every one of us were moved that we could actually move the world every time I got around him. It's like a Geiger counter. He finds gold when it's all hidden in every one of us, told us who we could be and what we could do. He wrestled at times over the large words Jesus would give him, but he met someone who believed to the same degree he did, if not more. Your personality brought him comfort. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> he would sometimes say, I feel like Lou. I hope I'm not making sound. This touches me. You called him the adrenal gland of the body of Christ, his favorite nickname. And he was, and Wes Campbell. <laughs> you don't know. Him. I pondered that one great moment when my breath was taken away. My wife and I were walking from Kona. You had gathered major leaders to discuss Alan Hood, Mike Bickle. I had no clue what I was doing there, but I was there. And, we, and then I, I preached, I think, at the Kona, whatever that little. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that place with the basketball courts. <laughs> My wife and I are walking to those beautiful places there, you know. And uh, my wife are 40, 40 years married now. And she uh, makes me rich. And uh, we're walking away and, and then, I don't remember how it happened, but we, we hear this chanting going on. Come with us, Lou! Come with us, Lou. And I don't know, hundreds are saying, come with us, Lou. So Trez and I turn around and we come. And I, they were wanting me to run with circuit riders and the sand or whatever that was. <laughs> I will never forget that because I believe that message may be the greatest message that could ever happen. That was his shout to the whole world. Come with us. Come with us. What about 80 million souls? Come with us. 200,000 missionaries. Come with us. I have a feeling he's gathering the great cloud of witnesses. And he said, come with us. We got to pray for those dudes down there. They need big help. Come with us. like I might just want to end that time. I honor the man. He was a great friend. He moved me, motivated me, gave me big vision. And of course, I, I, there's people here through Andy and so many, David. But I, I just want to honor the man. But I thought we would do something here today that seemed really weird <laughs> for a funeral. Uh, would you allow me to do that stand? And I want us to shout it to the north, south, and east, and west. Who knows? This moment could be the mantle passing moment. And people will hear this sound like they've never heard it. To come to Jesus and to come change the world in evangelism and prayer. Would you just begin to chant, shout, shout with me? Come with us. Come with us. Go ahead. Come with us. Come with us. Come with us. Come with us. Come with us, come with us, 80 million souls, come with us, 200,000 laborers, come with us, come with us, come with us, come with us. Give a shout to God.
Wow, that was perfect. Thank you so much, Lou. Next, we're going to hear from another one of Brian's heroes, Daniel Kalenda from the SEN Collaboration and Lead CFAN. And Brian truly believed and championed Daniel as one of the greatest evangelists alive on the earth. And uh, Daniel sent a video from his most recent crusade in Nigeria just to honor Brian. Brian would honor Daniel every year around Christmas by finding the biggest, most expensive steak possible and mailing it to Daniel for Christmas. Let's watch this video. Hello, Christy. Christy. Daniel, Daniel Kalenda here, here with my beautiful wife, Rebecca. Hi, Christy. And we're coming to you from the field here in Ibadan, Nigeria, where there is an absolutely historic harvest of souls that's taking place. We've seen record-breaking numbers here this week, signs and wonders and miracles, and we've just been talking about how incredible it is that this harvest continues to go on and on. And as we we're here, I just couldn't help but think about you and Brian and the amazing contribution that, that you have made to the harvest of souls and to evangelism around the world. And I couldn't let this opportunity, while we're here in the midst of this moment, I couldn't let this pass me by. I wanted to send a message to you and say, thank you, Christy. Thank you, Brian. Thank you to the entire family for the price that you have paid to see the harvest go forth. And I want you to know that we are going to continue to carry that torch of the gospel forward. We're believing God for do, to do even greater things in the days to come. I know this is a very difficult time for you. I know that your heart is breaking, but we know that Brian is with Jesus in heaven. He's cheering us on from the grandstands of heaven with that great cloud of witnesses, and we will continue to run this race until Jesus comes. Christy, we love you. We're praying for you and the whole family, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Until then, God bless you. We love you. Bye-bye. Bye, Christy. -bye. Bye. Brian loved Reinhard Bonnke. He would watch videos after video after video of the mass crowds being saved in Africa. This was such a special tribute to Brian. Next, we're going to hear from one of Brian's closest friends in the world, Matt Nelson. And before Matt comes, you know, Matt has the unique role or unique, I should say, friendship of having walked with Brian for over 22 years. And if I remember right, really Matt's first, you know, act of friendship was to become the janitor at church. And before long, Matt found himself as a co-leader, as a confidant, and in many ways as one of Brian's closest, closest friends. There are few people that know Brian, served Brian, and really honored Brian for the length of time and in the way that Matt Nelson did. And Brian had lots of affectionate terms for Matt, um, affectionate nicknames. One of them was Sergeant Slaughter. Another was Captain America, but I think his favorite was the Manimal. So would you... <laughs> Would you welcome Matt Nelson to come and share? This is amazing. I love you guys. So fun to see so many faces and people from so many different eras or circles of walks of life. Uh, uh, of, of Brian, but to see everyone together is really incredible. I'm blown away by the video because, as Andy said, like truly, as long as I knew Brian, one of his favorite things was Reinhard Bonnke and mass evangelism. Amen. How many of you are inspired by that? And uh, so it, it's funny. This isn't part of my deal, and I promise I'll jump right in. But uh, when the day Brian passed, I picked my oldest son up from school, and, and I had to, to tell David and it was, his response was so fitting. The first thing that my oldest son, David, said was he goes, like almost kind of jealous of Brian. He goes, oh, he's with Reinhard Bonnke right now. <laughs> and I hadn't even thought of that. And I was like, dang, he is with Ryan Honky, Ryan, Ryan, Reinhard Bonnke. That's not fair, you know. So, so pumped. I'm just going to read uh, my notes here and pray for grace to, uh, to make it through. This is awesome. I first met Brian in March of 1999, and I had the honor and privilege of walking with Brian as a friend for 22 years. Brian impacted and shaped every part of my life. He was, uh, part, of, uh, every, he was part of or catalyzed every major milestone of my adult life from 18 years old until today. I can say without question that everything good I know as a man, a husband, a father, a leader, and a friend I learned from Brian. How many of you feel that's true? 
Yeah, come on. Thanks for saving me there. <clears throat> In the days following Brian's passing, I felt the Lord told me to make a list of all of my favorite Brian qualities. And if you know Brian, he loved a list. Brian would pretend he knew what the list was, but you knew he was making the list up on the spot. How many of you ever had a moment where he gave you a number and you knew he didn't know what he was going to say next? But he made a great list, right? It's true. So I felt the Lord said to me, Matt, make a list of all your favorite Brian qualities. And the list quickly got out of control and way too long. That's true. It, took, it started to go pages. And I just want to say Brian was such a dynamic person. And looking around the room today, his impact on all of our lives is so evident. So what I want to do is I want to take a minute in honor of Brian and his love for lists, um, and I just want to highlight a few of the more maybe personal attributes that, in my view, made Brian great. When Nick called, which thank you for this privilege and opportunity means so much to me, I kind of said, gosh, I, I don't even know where to start, Nick. I have no idea what I would share. It's been 22 years of basically the best, the, the best of everything. And Nick said, Matt, why don't you share kind of maybe the more personal side of Brian? So these might be things that maybe you wouldn't think of as the top things, but in my view, after 22 years of friendship, these would be things I would think of as sort of the personal side um, of Brian. So number one was this, Brian was a man of wild prophetic unction. How many of you ever heard the word unction from Brian and it was the first time you ever heard it, but you were like, that word makes total sense. I've never heard it before, but that's you. Brian would claim that he was not prophetic, but the truth is, he moved in crazy prophetic unction. I would say as his friend and being behind the scenes of many of those moments, it's very possible Brian was the most prophetic person that I ever met. He had an uncanny ability to discern the winds of the Spirit and to forcefully seize that moment and opportunity. He was led by the Spirit in every category of his life. Number two, Brian was insanely generous. He set a standard of intense and spirit-led generosity. As long as I knew Brian, he genuinely loved giving. And not just giving, but he put painstaking time and energy into nailing the perfect gift. You, there's chuckles there. You guys know that's true. You, can never, you could never outgive Brian. He loved, and this is true, his favorite thing was a dramatic reaction from the recipient. This isn't my notes, but I don't know if you can relate to this. This is Brian's friend. If I knew he was going to give me a gift, I felt stress about responding right. Did anyone else have like, man, I got to get stoked right now? Because if you weren't as stoked, he would look at you with big eyes like, oh, no, I missed it. So in my mind, I would just think, Jesus, I want to be a good friend and give me a tear even right now just to, to, to pump him up. And he would give you the gift. Kids, you know, this is true. And he had this face. He would look in your eyes as he gave you the gift like waiting. And there was stress in the moment, like, I need to be so amped right now. <laughs> Brian was the most satisfied when he knew he had blown your mind with a gift that exceeded your wildest expectations. Number three, one of my favorite qualities of Brian was Brian was a dreamer. One of Brian's favorite pictures or pieces of art was an old-fashioned picture of a young boy standing in Wembley Soccer Stadium, I believe, staring at empty seats full of goals. And that was truly the way Brian saw the world from my perspective. It was full of opportunities, and Brian dreamed of taking the shot. But more than that, and bigger than that really, Brian loved drawing other people into a greater vision and a greater storyline for their own life. I can't count the times I saw Brian lay down what his dream was to give his dream away to someone else and bring them into a broader storyline. He had a unique ability to inspire you to dream bigger and think bigger than you thought possible, sometimes even bigger than you wanted to think. In Brian's dreams, there was always room for everyone at the table. Nobody got left out. Number four, Brian was incredibly funny. He had the best sense of humor. He was marked by a childlike joy, and Brian had a way of making you laugh and repent at the same time. Am I the only one who groaned every time he spoke publicly? Because you knew you were going to do two things. You were for sure going to laugh, and you were for sure going to repent deeper than you ever thought possible. 
Brian loved laughing at the most inappropriate times. Like right now, he would have been just making the, wor the, the worst jokes for the moment, but that was Brian. I can't remember how many times in the midst of a deeply powerful worship set, I would be interrupted by a hand on my forehead. Does anyone know where I'm going? A fake prayer language, maybe it was real, but it was spoken in a way where I was like, I'm not sure that's real right now. And it completely ruined the moment of worship. And Brian felt so satisfied, like, he'd be pumped, like, yes, I got you out of the secret place. <laughs> that's true, he did it all the time. How many of you raise a hand if he ever pulled you out of the secret place and you're like, come on, man, that's messed up. And yet, that lightheartedness was the perfect expression of the Holy Spirit to me. Number five, you guys okay for a few more? All right, Brian was the nickname master as has been pointed out. If you were around Brian for any time at all, he usually anointed you with a nickname. It was his way of pulling you close, affirming you, or just putting you at ease. Somehow these names both poked fun at your greatest insecurities, <laughs> but also inspired you simultaneously, and I'm not quite sure how he did that, but he did do that. He gave me many nicknames over the years, none of which will be shared today. But of course, Brian reserved the best nicknames for himself. Of course, Snack Man has been talked about, but my personal favorite, Brian's nickname for himself, was Prism. You guys ever heard of this, Prism? And of course, it was because in Brian's eyes, it was his ability to see things in a futuristic, colorful, and a multifaceted way. I'll leave this out, but a few of us not naming names, but Nick and Holly and myself that day also got nicknames, and I just wanna note, because we get the last word, that none of ours were as cool as his, and so that seemed unfair, but, but there it was. Okay, number six, <clears throat> uh, Brian was brave. He was always willing to do the hard thing. He was willing to try something new that had never been tried before. Brian thrived on pioneering grace. If I had a dollar for every time he said, give me pioneering grace, We'd have a lot of money right now. He was gritty, he was gutsy, he craved, and I chose that word, he craved the word of the Lord and was unrelenting in pursuing God's highest until he was completely convinced that God had said exactly what he wanted to say and he had received the full measure of glory due his name. And this is my last one, here it is, thank you for bearing with me. Number seven is Brian was the ultimate family man in my view. He cherished his family. Brian set an amazing standard and an example as a husband and a father. Long before Christy was healed and well, I'm not gonna look up right now, enough, he would always bring her with him. And it's so funny that, Lou, you did that because to me, Brian lived that with Christy for all those years. He would drag her along, whether it be physically or by a phone call or the word of the Lord or saying literally what Christy would say to say. He, took, he brought you with him. Whether it be by prayer download or sharing, I said that, there we go. Brian was adamant that everything was better when Christy was there. He invested countless hours, relentless prayer, and creative methods to develop his kids into the giants that they are today. Brian and I often spoke privately of his personal pride and joy over each of his kids. That's true. It was the most talked about subject between he and I over the last 10 years. Brian referred to each of you as legacy builders. He truly loved and enjoyed each of you. For as long as I knew Brian, he embodied a special kind of love that filled all of us with the courage and the confidence in God's love for us. He exuded the affection of Jesus Christ for everyone around him, and that to me was Brian's life message. Thank you. How'd I do? Thank you, Matt. That was so powerful, bro. Next, we're going to get to hear from another one of uh, Brian's most long-standing relationships. Aaron Barker was Brian's first worship leader. 
and to help to start the entire movement that came out of Tacoma. And Aaron had the unique anointing and ability to take the song or the, the messages of the movement and turn them into song and sing them all over the world. And uh, Brian loved the Barker family. He loved each child in the Barker family. He loved the Barkers. I can't count how many times Brian would say to me privately how proud of Aaron he was. And so would you just welcome Aaron Barker to share with us now. Love you, Brent family. And uh, I'm going to share a song with you. And I wrote dozens of songs and always loved that moment where I got to come and share that song with Brian for the first time. And he always responded with such joy and excitement, even if it was kind of a so so song. <laughs> and I wrote a few of those. <laughs> Um, but I actually, as Matt was speaking, I was remembering the morning of Matt and Laura's wedding. He called me up and said, we've got to do a song for Matt and Laura's wedding. <laughs> and so he had me write a song called Swords Drawn. <laughs> and during Matt and Laura's wedding, we had a montage of photos of Reinhard Bonnke scenes. I think he got permission from Laura. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember writing this ridiculously intense song for this wedding. The opening line was, I see in a mother who, with eyes upon her kids who spent her last dollar, a meal enough for one of them. And I'm thinking, this is a wedding song? <laughs> But I asked Christy what was the emotion she was going for, and she said, joy. And there, we shared the stage countless times since I met Brian in 1996, I believe. And when we would be on the stage together, he would unannounced say, Aaron's going to write a song right now. And then he would go on to feed me some of the most non-poetic statements that he would want me to include in this spontaneous song. And so here is this absolute non-musician who has really birthed a music movement in this place. And he pulled music out of me, and he pulled music out of Spencer, and he pulled it out of Josh, and he pulled it out of Chloe, and he pulled a message out of Nick. <laughs> And there was a season where Brian and I were in the midst of a, a T.D. Jakes kick. And we would listen to T.D. Jakes all the time. We'd drive up to Federal Way and find the latest T.D. Jakes sermon. And then at the same time, we were really impacted by the Brownsville revival. And, and so I, at Brian's prompting, wrote a song called You Are the Champion. And Brian was a man of audacious faith. And he was a man of hilarious joy. And he was a man that was absolutely consumed by the glory of Jesus. And so I wrote this song, and I just remember as I was writing it, just thinking of what's the most ridiculous statement I could say? What's this? What's that? And so I wrote this song called You Are the Champion. And I just know that Jesus is gonna see the most remarkable exploits done by this generation. And that we're gonna see an amazing move of God in our generation. And the dreams and the visions and the words that Brian saw in his spirit are gonna come to reality. And so this afternoon, I want us to throw an absolute Holy Ghost faith party in Jesus' name that what God has said he is going to accomplish, he will do in Jesus' name, amen?
one more shout of praise after that. That was so good. Thank you, Aaron. Incredible. What? This is already the most powerful memorial service I have ever been to in my life. 
and we've not even heard from the family, which we're going to have the privilege in a moment. And as has been said by pretty much everyone that has shared is that one of the things that most marked Brian was his love for his family. It was astounding. I would say of all of us that knew him well and were husbands, Brian's love for Christy made all of us love our wives more. Brian's love for his children caused all of us to want to take our parenting to the next level. If you got into the very core of Brian's life, it wasn't even the incredible ministry exploits we know him for. It wasn't the remarkable passion for evangelism. The very core of Brian's life was his love for his family and his desire to see all of us love our families the same way that he was. He was such an inspiration. I want to say to the Brent family, even from Holly and I, as we were committed to Brian, we will be committed to you. We love you. We love you. He's so proud of you guys. We're so grateful that you shared his life with us for so many years. You shared him, Christy, with all of us, so many trips to come and be with us, to, to pour his life into us. For each of the kids, you shared him so well. And so we love you we're so honored to be able to share this day with you, and we can't wait to hear from you. So would you guys welcome the first and the youngest of the Brent family, Josh Brent, to come and share with us. Hey guys, I'm just going to get right into it, if you don't mind. <sighs> Brian Brent is my father, my friend, my brother, my coach, my role model, my mentor, and the list goes on. The amount of roles he has in my life is just unfair. My dad is a legacy builder. Our family wouldn't be anywhere close to where it is now because of this man's sacrificial love. Even in the midst of having 50% lung capacity in an excruciating health battle, he still decided that his top priority was to make sure that I was always having fun. He never made us perform for ministry. He never forced us into loving God. He set such an amazing model for us that we ourselves decided that we didn't want to do anything else but what our dad was doing. You know in the movies when the character comes up with an on-the-spot speech, but it's so perfect that it's unbelievable. That's what my dad does. Just a bit ago, I was crying on the phone with my dad, broken and discouraged about my worth and what I had done to make a difference. He responded by laughing and telling me to get on my bike and, and ride to his house. When I got there, I was going on about how I needed prayer and deliverance, and he continued to laugh and say, Josh, everything you just told me is false and fake, and you don't need prayer. You need some hot chocolate. <laughs> Josh, you're taking life too seriously. You practically want to achieve life in 19, and that's not God's will for you. That's the enemy telling you to take life too serious. Life is meant to be fun. Life with God is meant to be fun. So tell God that you repent of believing these list of lies of yourself and start dreaming about the future, about all the things God has promised over your wonderful life. It's Kobe time, baby. Dad, you still continue to shock me every time I tell you something, thinking that it's going to go one way when it really goes the other. Thank you, Dad, for always having my back and leading me to shoot the winning shots of the game. Dad, you always say you never forget. So I say to the day I die, I will never forget what you've done to impact the millions of lives that have met Jesus through your kind heart. What I just read was a post I posted five months prior to my dad's death. It didn't need to be his birthday to honor the kind of man he was. He was just that good of a father. The amount of love he's carried for his kids was just beyond anything I've seen. He was so selfless. He raised, <laughs> sorry guys. He raised four different individuals who are so alike, yet each carrying something so specific and different. 
He personally walked with us hand in hand, mentally, physically, and spiritually, fighting the battles we faced with us. As a small child, I would hear my parents warring against the enemy, praying for hours on end throughout the night, just so we could get a night of rest without the enemy coming and disrupting our dreams. They were driven to destroy anything that would stop us from meeting God for ourselves. Even in the most minor ways, my dad made sure that no condemnation ever fell over me. In 2016, I was attending an online school at home. It was the final week of the school year, and I was freaking out about my science final. I pulled the trigger on my test and, on my test and pushed submit and got an all-time embarrassing low of 32%. <laughs> Woo! I was so embarrassed to tell my dad, especially because it was like literally the most basic science test ever. But I had to do it. I walked down to the living room and told him what I scored. And I then began to break down in tears and started to tell him how dumb I was and then began to compare myself to everyone in my class that was getting straight A's, rambling on about how, how ashamed I was over the grade. And thinking he would be mad, he responded pretty neutrally and said, Hey, I'll retake the test for you. <laughs> Completely shocked, I said, you're going to cheat for me? And he said, no, nah, I'll just help. He then proceeded to literally lock me out of my own room to complete the test on his own. And after about 25 minutes, he came out and told me that he was done. I went into the room, looked at the grade, and my eyes could not believe it. He scored an even lower grade of 10%. Bruh. Hey. I ran out of, room, out of my room and said, how on earth did you even manage to get that many choices wrong by chance? Like, that's literally impressive, Dad. <laughs> he responded while laughing and said, it looks like I'm worse at science than you. <laughs> he then, in response, took me to McDonald's to get a Sunday, then watched a whole Lord of the Rings movie with me till 2 a.m. that same night. <laughs> Afterward, as we went to bed, he told me that no matter what, I was his teammate and that he would always be by my side. He told me that he would help me study all week together to ace the test that following Friday. I went to bed feeling like a hundred bucks, so relieved. Now what I didn't know, which I found out this year when he told me, is that he purposely retook the test for me that night to get the worst grade possible, so I would think that I was even smarter than him and that I wouldn't feel like I was a dummy. Stories like this happened over a thousand times of every, in every area of my life. He was my father, he was my dad, but he, wanted, but he wanted me to feel like I was his brother. He wanted me to see that we were teammates and that we were in it together. Now his life continues. I sadly will no longer have that teammate by my side. <laughs> And I will miss that every single day. I will miss my greatest support. My whole life he was there cheering me on on the sideline. He believed in my calling, my music, and my message like no other. My dad was irreplaceable. He was everything I wanted and still want to be. He was the ultimate role model. His love for God moved me to give my life to God. And because of that, I will carry on what he has handed off. Thank you. I now welcome Spencer Brandt.
everybody. Whew. Might just stay a little bit right here to get through this. Whew. Today, more than any day, I feel the impossibility of summarizing the man my father was. I've had a wrestle in my soul because it feels my heart can't find the fullness of language it wants to honor him with. However, one thing has rung in my spirit. It was the greatest battle my dad fought for me, the battle for me to believe. My dad had a resilience in his belief in people. I know this because he had a resilience in his belief in me. His belief was much different than a mere understanding and an acceptance of who I was or a sentiment expressed by encouraging words. It was a belief that would find a way, no matter the cost, to convince me of my true identity. My dad wanted me to know who I was. He wanted me to understand my destiny. He wanted me to know what I was made for, and he wanted me to know like he knew. To me, it felt like everything he did as a father was to express this deep love and belief in me. I think his love was synonymous with his belief in me. He went to incredible lengths to convince me I was who he said I was. When I was in sixth grade, I had a rough year at school, and I was made fun of by peers. In his opinion, I was under-challenged academically. (laughs) The summer after this tough year, he put me in the car and drove me to a school long out of our district, a private school with an extravagant campus. He said to me, Spencer, you're a genius, and this is where geniuses belong. (laughs) Little did I know that my dad, a pastor with a modest church salary, was going to put me, an 11-year-old, in a middle school whose yearly tuition equaled the price of a new car. He didn't have the money. God didn't show him how he would get it, but God did tell him I was to go to that school. Most parents sent their kids to this school so they could later qualify and earn scholarships to the most prestigious universities. My dad sent me there for the sole purpose of convincing me who I was that I was worth something, that I was intelligent. For him, it was all about finding the loudest, clearest, deepest way he could express his belief in me. Later in life, I grew a deep passion for music. My dad was not a musician, but he understood the deep purpose of music in the kingdom far more than I did. As an 18-year-old, he called me up to his room and asked me, what do we really need to make music to change the world? My dad handed me his laptop and said, If we don't know what we're asking for, how can we ask God for it? Make a list. (laughs) Little did I know that my dad, a missionary living by financial faith, would turn this list into an online shopping cart. And in a matter of minutes, a credit card would be maxed out (laughs) with equipment on the way. My dad didn't think twice because my dad wanted to convince me of my destiny. My dad believed I had a sound and he wanted me to have everything I needed to find it. My, le- my dad loved to take us with him when he would travel to speak or to train. I distinctly remember being 16 years old and traveling with my dad to a school where he was training. My dad spoke his first session, and after the lunch break, while all the students began to sit down, he called me over and said, Spence, you're going to teach this next session. He handed me his freedom manual. He handed me his platform, his message, And with a tremendous smile, he decided that he wanted to be represented by me. I think a lot of us feel that way. He didn't think twice about his reputation. Like best friends, we would celebrate this small act as if I had achieved the greatest thing in the world. He was convincing me I had something to say. What my dad lacked in ability as a musician or an artist, my dad made up in understanding them. He knew every great artist had the confidence to create the sound that lives inside their head and to say what they really believe deep in their soul. It was never about the money, the equipment, or the speaking. It was about getting me to believe that I was an artist, to have the audacity to say, I have a sound, I have a message, and I'm going to make it. Before my dad passed, he saw me do it. He saw me do it with Lindy with the circuit riders, and with my brother Josh. My dad won his battle for belief. Dad, more than my calling, what I will miss most was my friendship with you. 
three years ago, I distinctly remember making the decision to only talk about music with you when you brought it up, and I would work to be a friend to you. Nothing made me more happy than loving you like you had loved me. Over the last few months, I got to be there for you like you had so many times been there for me. But this time, it was at your bedside and in the hospital. Those moments were greater than anything I have or will ever create. Dad, I want you to know I'll never stop believing, and I'll carry our friendship for the rest of my life. I love you, Pops. Thank you. I'd like to invite my sister Chloe. Love you, Chloe. All right. My dad was my hero. To me, he was valiant. Courage wasn't something I would see from him time to time, it was his daily song. A cadence so strong, so bone rattling, that this characteristic of my dad practically raised me. I never outgrew the wonder a little girl has for their dad. In my adult years, my wonder only grew as I gained a deeper understanding of the mountains my dad had conquered in his life. Sickness, pioneering ministry, living financially by faith, persecution, obeying the Lord's big asks, he never cowered. In my early teen years, we went on a trip to Singapore together where my own health battle began. I was struggling to get out of bed. He barged in one morning and woke me up and he gave me the most epic speech on winning. That was my first indoctrination of Kobe Bryant's Mamba mentality. I questioned my dad and said something like, you can't always win though, right? I can still see him now standing over my bed saying, no matter how loud life screams, you will lose, even if there is no possible way, you can always win. He was absolutely matter of fact. That day changed me, and I began to see into the window of how my dad overcame every obstacle in his life. You see, God can, God does, and God will wasn't just a cute, catchy phrase for my dad. It was the frame of his life. With this faith, we fought together for many things, but the most beautiful will always be for my mom's healing. He cared for her with extravagance, a picture of Jesus for his bride. One of the best days of our lives was seeing her healed at the send. And then I was next. Battling my own illness, he cared for me with that same wild extravagance until I was healed. Then there was left only him. And this time, I got to watch Jesus care for him extravagantly. In the last months, Jesus met him in countless encounters with his love. Through pain, he shed tears daily, describing these encounters to us. It was his turn. Jesus took him, and he healed him face to face. Dad, all three of us are healed now. Every promise fulfilled, Jesus has won. My dad was my pursuer. He wrote me poems where he was Mordecai and he called me Blue. He took me on dates. To this day, the majority of my wardrobe is from my dad. Even the last day I got to talk with him, he bought me earrings from his hospital bed. He was never shy with affirmation. Rather, it was his greatest passion instilling into all of us kids who we were. I remember my dad making me stand on our kitchen counter when I was little and sing as loud as I could. He waited until I got through every giggle and, I, and meant every word I said. He made sure I knew my voice as a woman mattered. When I was 13, we sat in an airport and he explained to me what the Western standard of beauty was. We made a, ta a pact together that day to wage war against it. Later, he wrote me a sign that said, I am beautiful, and he made me march around the house yelling it over and over again. 
When my time came to start dating, I really worried if I would ever meet anyone that could pursue me and lead me like my dad. Then Derek came. My dad and I were on the way to Costco together when I told him that I found someone I thought was going to change the world. I had only talked to Derek a few times, and my dad turned to me, and he asked for his phone number and straight up called him right there (laughs) on the 405. He told Derek he wanted to be his best friend and pour into his life. When he hung up, he reminded me that my husband was going to be his best friend. Derek and my dad truly did become best friends. The night before I got married, I walked into my dad's room crying. I told him I was afraid our relationship was going to change. He stopped everything and he grabbed me firmly and said, I will always pursue you. He pursued Derek and I in a way that I know I'll never experience again. Lastly, my dad was my general. (laughs) He was my captain, oh captain. When I was 17, he told me to watch Saving Private Ryan. (laughs) He told me, he told me to watch that beach full of young men and imagine what the war for souls looks like, the war for a movement of mass salvation. Just last year, I had a dream that my dad and I were on the shores of Normandy and it was D-Day. We ran from the water onto the shores as as bullets flew everywhere. My dad went hand-to-hand combat with the opposition. In the dream, I said to myself, I really don't want to be here. And a voice answered, this day changed history, and you get to be a part of it. I believe what my dad fought for, we have either seen the fulfillment or the birth of. My dad got in the trenches with a generation not his own. He fought not only for young people, but he fought among young people. He deeply understood the fatherless generation. If only we could tally the hours of prayer he and my mom spent praying for revival. If only you could see inside our house the posters that filled the wall with the words of the Lord. Words about the send, words about fields of full salvation, 80 million saved, 200,000 missionary sent. On our last night with my dad, we surrounded his bed and declared we will continue to chase these words. No matter how costly this fight becomes, We will be met with the joy only harvesters like my dad experienced. Dad, I finish by saying to you, the ship is anchored safe and sound. Its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object one. Thank you. I'd like to invite up Nick. Man, I love you guys. There has never been anyone I have ever wanted to be more like than my dad. As early as I can remember, I wanted to be like him. From the beginning, we had a special bond. My mom was chronically sick, and I was the oldest, so there was this sense that my dad gave me that he needed me to be a man with him, to take care of my mom, to take care of my siblings. We were a team. Whatever my dad did, I wanted to do too. When my dad was closing business deals in his office, I sat at a little desk next to his and built Legos. When my dad started gathering young people at our house in Spanaway, Washington, I would sit up late on the stairway to listen and watch what he would say. When my dad started the church, I rarely went to kids' ministry, junior high or high school ministry, because I never wanted to miss my dad preaching. There was an electricity in the air that I couldn't bear to miss. When we moved to Youth with a Mission, Kona, I didn't think twice when he asked us if we wanted to go. I would follow him anywhere. When we started Circa Riders, the same. The send, the same. It was a no-brainer. Wherever my dad went and whatever he did, I was in because my dad was my hero, and he made me feel I was needed on his team. When I was 13, I remember my dad walking up to me in the hallway on the way out the door to church, and he said to me with a straight face that I was a man now, and I didn't need to go to church anymore unless I personally wanted to. I was shocked and almost insulted. 
he was a senior pastor, all right? So <laughs> I reassured him my love for the church, for God, and my loyalty to him. <laughs> I never had a backslidden season. It was never even a temptation. The Jesus I experienced with my dad was more real than anything else the world around me had to offer. It was never religious. It was never duty. It was always love. I have never known a man with a relationship with God like my dad. It was like they had a secret special relationship where they were always talking and I wanted to get in on it. And my dad showed me the way. He showed me the cross, humility, dedication, unwavering faith, love for others, the pursuit of his glory, mercy, compassion, freedom, authority, and the power of God. He showed me Jesus. As I got a bit older, our teamwork went to a new level as my dad started including me in the work of the ministry. And it wasn't token involvement. He took me incredibly seriously, even from a young age. When I was 14, my dad called me as he was about to step into a meeting. He wanted to pray with me and seek a prophetic word for the man he was meeting with. I told him what I saw and heard, some of which was a rebuke. He went into that meeting and told the man exactly what I had said. That man was the CEO of Focus on the Family. My dad believed in me more than I believed in me. We did this countless times, praying for thousands of people around the world together. Over time, it evolved from prophetic ministry into giving me opportunities to speak. He wrote my first sermon. It was on breaking free of passivity and fear. And the opening line was, I'm calling the big dogs off the porch. I started gaining rapid confidence. By the time we moved to California for circuit riders in college, he, made, he had made me believe anything was possible and I was capable of it. When I wanted to do an outreach at USC called LaunchFest, he believed me. When my friends and I said we wanted to do a national tour of college campuses called Carry to Love, he believed us. My dad believed in me so much he made me believe in myself. He showed me how to believe. In my sophomore year of high school, I was attending a Christian school, and he casually mentioned switching to the public school on our way back home one day. I thought nothing of it as I was deeply involved at my current school. But one night after church, I was mopping the floor working as the church janitor, and I had a sudden encounter with God where he asked me to be a missionary to the very local high school my dad had mentioned. When I came home crying under the power of God, he never said that he was the one who came up with the idea. And he helped me switch schools in the middle of the year, no questions asked. At Azusa now, he came up with a concept to lift our shoes in the air. As it was going to be too dangerous to throw our shoes on the stage, like we had did in smaller gatherings. As we were standing on the stadium stage, my dad's time slot to call the stadium to go was approaching with Lauren Cunningham and Andy Bird. And I knew how deeply this moment was going to mean for his life. As it came, the last minute, he pushed me forward instead of himself and said, call the stadium to the shoes. It erupted. When we finished that night, all he could talk about was how proud he was of me. He never mentioned his time slot or that it was his idea. My dad had this uncanny ability to know the future before I did. He never rubbed it in my face, but instead he would humbly position me for he saw God leading me often at his own expense. My dad's empowerment is the only reason I am who I am today. He showed me the way forward. And I think that's what he did for so many of us. Whether we have realized it or not, he made us feel needed. He pushed us closer to Jesus. He believed in us until we believed in ourselves, and he empowered us, giving us a platform usually at his own expense. As I got older, I realized that this was never an accident or the result of mere personality traits, but that there was a method to the madness. It was once said, the worst leader is the one who the people fear. A good leader is the one the people revere. But the great leader, when his work is done, his aim fulfilled, the people say, we did it ourselves. My dad was a true genius. He developed people like a master artist paints a masterpiece. He built people because that's who Jesus came for, people. He built people because Jesus built people. And no doubt, 
you are here today because in some way my dad built into you. And I think the greatest way we could honor him is if we made those around us feel like they were needed. We pushed them closer to Jesus. We believed in them until they believed in themselves. And we empowered the next generation, giving them our platforms, even at our own expense. My dad was my best friend. I never had a plan B but to serve my dad my whole life. I can't remember a week that went by that we didn't talk at least five or six days of the week. We were a team. He was my best friend. He understood me like no one else has ever given me that privilege. I think because he built the beast. <laughs> it's by design. And I think that all of us could honor his legacy by choosing people over ministry. And building and multiplying and doing and walking in the DNA that he showed us. God, I pray for every person in this room today, Lord. Every friend of my dad, every friend of Brian. Every spiritual son, every spiritual daughter. Every spiritual son and daughter from seasons past. We pray that you would awaken every bit of belief that you put in them. That you would awaken every dream in them that my dad believed for them. God, we pray that you would anoint us to carry his torch, that you would anoint us to carry his legacy, Lord, and that you would multiply in a way that my dad never imagined. We love you, and I love you, Dad. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But can we give a huge round of applause to the matriarch herself, my mom, Christy Brand. Thanks, buddy. Hi. Oh, nice. Oh. I am marveling at the people we know. I am marveling at who Brian knew. I, I, this is a great cloud of witnesses, there's no question. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to honor my husband. I wanna thank also everyone watching on live stream and honor Brian's parents, T and Willie Brent, my parents, Shirley and Bert McGee, just thank you for everything that you've poured into us and invested in us. I'm going to step right in, and I'm really thankful I only have four kids because I don't think I could have made it. <laughs> to encapsul encapsulate someone is a difficult task in general, but to encapsulate Brian is <laughs> almost impossible. I met Brian the summer of my sophomore year in college. I was 19 and Brian was 20. We'd gone to rival high schools in Lake Oswego, Oregon, but we had never met. The first time I saw and met Brian was at a barn dance. <laughs> when I saw him, I immediately knew there was something different about him. And boy, was I right. He asked me to church, and then he asked me to lunch and a long drive, and three years later, we were married. What I came to understand quickly was that Brian was zealously passionate about Jesus. He had just recommitted his life to Jesus one year prior after listening to the three-time Super Bowl champion coach Joe Gibbs <laughs> preach the gospel. He really did have a thing for coaches. He really did. He and a group of friends had gained a reputation on his college campus for their passionate pursuit of Jesus. The student bodies nicknamed these four guys the Zealots. So fitting to Brian. The man with so much zeal. Brian was always a catalyst. Even as a child, he was instrumental in starting and forming the first soccer leagues in Portland. 
Now that he was walking with Jesus, it went in a whole nother level. His evangelistic passion showed up quickly, and he organized his first ever event, an evangelistic crusade, where he invited the ex-gang leader, Nikki Cruz, to his college campus. The venue packed out, and many hundreds were saved. Hundreds were saved. He was a junior in college. This zeal, catalytic edge, and evangelistic passion never left him. I saw it play out over and over again. I saw it when we started our church in Tacoma, Washington, when we formed and started Circuit Riders, and when we set out to start the Send. It was a magnetic combination that drew young people far and wide to be around him. It really wasn't something he tried to do. It really was who he was. He was indefatigable. Even through years of fighting through his sickness, there was always more. More of Jesus to be had, more souls to reach, more young people to raise up, more leaders to be empowered, more breakthroughs to be pressed for, more movements to be catalyzed. Brian was a man of the more and exploits his whole life, and he raised the water level of faith in everyone around him. What I didn't know until later was the morning before he met me, he had gone to the coast to pray. And he said the most unusual statement to the Lord that day. He said, I'm ready. If you give me a wife, I'll serve her for the rest of my life. I don't think he knew when he prayed that his wife would be chronically ill for 32 of those 40, 34 years. Or that he would meet me that night. <laughs> To fully understand Brian, you can't see his catalytic passion, all the movements he pioneered, or his powerful communication gift. You have to see the Brian I knew, the loving caretaker. From the beginning of our marriage, my sickness was evidence with long bouts of unexplainable fatigue. Doctors simply diagnosed me with chronic fatigue syndrome because they weren't sure what else to call it. By the time our family left Tacoma and moved to Kona, uh, Hawaii, the intensity of my t fatigue started to increase. And by the time we got to California, I had neurological symptoms, couldn't walk straight anymore. I had intense brain fog, I couldn't read. I would have had intermittent seizures, I never knew when they were coming. And for the last seven years of my sickness, I was completely bedridden, almost completely bedridden. But Brian was the best in every possible way. He had a way of dignifying me in my sickness. He never stopped insisting on our teamwork and always made a way to keep it going. He would pull out pump-up speeches when I couldn't go anymore out of thin air. <laughs> that would turn me completely around in the moment. He was patient, he was kind, he was extravagant. He never stopped pursuing me, writing me letters, buying me lavish gifts, taking me on dates, even if it was in our sweats with baseball caps. It was the sacrificial love of Jesus on display. I know there were inner deaths that Brian went through, dreams and ideas he wished we could do together if I was well, but he never brought those up. He found a way to make a special moment in the most ordinary and difficult days. What made it all the more extraordinary was that Brian had an unshakable faith that I would be fully healed. You all know that. <laughs> Even when the doctors finally diagnosed me with late stage neurological Lyme's disease and told us that no one recovers there's no medical cure. He did not waver. He consistently instigated prayer for my healing some, in most seasons daily. And in other seasons, maybe once, twice a week. He always believed it was right around the corner. Our first 
Christmas together, he gave me running shoes for many secutive Christmases, running shoes, because he said, you'll need these. You'll need these. After 32 years of fervent prayer, Brian and I received our answer when I was healed at the Send in Orlando. Amen. He went into full celebration, not just for a day or a week or months. He was like a kid in a candy store. He was meeting me as an adult for the first time, healed and well. He wanted to redate me all over again, and we did. We really did. But in Brian's last days, our roles reversed, and I became his caretaker. To think that he had done that. For me, for 32 years, with enduring love while sick himself, tells you all what you need to know about what the kind of relationship with Jesus he had and what kind of man he was. I remember that day like yesterday when I told Brian that God spoke to me that it was time to start our family. We'd never had the conversation before, but he didn't blink. He was immediately so full of happiness and excitement. <laughs> he was ready for his team. He was ready for his team, and a team he had. First Nick, then Chloe, Spencer, and the best surprise of our life <laughs> came six years later, <laughs> Josh. <laughs> watching Brian become a dad was like watching a professional, professional athlete step onto the field for the first time and find a passion that would mark the rest of their days. Out of the gate, he was unconventional. Because he was a natural trainer. He took time to understand each of our kids, and he wanted to know everything God would speak about who they were, who they would become. He was relentless in prayer, relentless. He was calculated, out of the box, methodical, at customizing his training to each of the personalities and calling each kid. In the most creative ways, he instilled identity in each of our kids and made them believe in themselves and taught them how to seek and hear God's voice. Even as they got older, he never stopped pouring himself into them, directing, advocating, loving, championing, celebrating, he loved it all. He loved being a father. Nothing made him more proud. As much as he was a trainer, he knew how to build a real relationship with all our kids. He knew how to have fun and make a memory. That's what he'd always call it. We're going to make a memory that no one would ever forget. His antics, chosen word, were constant. On school nights when I had everybody brushed in their PJs, heading to bed, it was wind down time. He would sneak up the stairs and steal everyone away for a late night ice cream run on a school night. <laughs> Trips, gifts, jokes, top teriyaki cokes, memories poured from every year of our family life with Brian. Paul in 1 Corinthians 4.15 says, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. In the last 10 years of his life, it was like everything that he had learned in his relationship with Jesus, in his ministry, in caretaking, and a father to my kids rolled over and he became a father of movements. He had a way of approaching every person and seeing the potential in them like he saw in our kids. He never grew tired of walking people to their next breakthrough. And he never stopped catalyzing everyone to win the lost. The force of Brian's love and the belief was enough to inspire you to win the whole generation to Christ. I saw it firsthand as men and women would leave times with Brian with blueprints in their hands they'd often hidden in their hearts. But Brian pulled them out and made them believe it. For some, it was becoming a circuit rider, taking a college or a high school, starting a church or a business. For others, it was going after nations, filling stadiums and mobilizing movements of worship, prayer, missions, and evangelism. 
Brian's two favorite prophetic promises, which have brought, been brought up several times tonight, was that he really fought for the mobilization of the 200,000 missionaries to saturate the world and 80 million souls to be saved here in America. Even though Brian is gone now, I fully believe he saw the beginning of that fulfillment. In Brian's last hours, as we were circled around his bed, the Lord spoke to me really plainly. And although it was really difficult to hear, it really rang true. I just heard the voice of the Lord say, Brian has finished his race. And he has imparted to everyone everything they need to fulfill their assignment. The fulfillment is living in this room right now. Living in people watching from across America and worldwide. Sitting in dorm rooms, on mission bases, in church offices, and unlikely places. If Brian were here to give you a final charge, I believe it would be to make the same commitment our family did around that deathbed. To live in radical faith to live in radical faith and believe the Lord at all costs. To live as a missionary despite the context or stage of life. To pursue the winning of souls all your days, especially the next generation. You'd say to men, radically love your brothers. Women, radically love your sisters. Wives, love and honor your husband. Husbands, cherish your wife. Mothers and fathers, believe for your children and explode in love over them. Leaders, invest in people, see them. Radically love them and lay down your life for them. And finally, pursue Jesus with everything you have until there's nothing left to give and Jesus takes you home. I know Brian loved each of you dearly, and so do I. I'll love you forever, Brian. Well, before we end, we have one more treat tonight, or evening, afternoon, whatever it is. Uh, we prepared a video, and we're going to play it. It's, uh, it's a tribute to our dad. What do you think? What are you thinking? What are you guys doing? You're looking for a treasure? Yeah. Well, Brian, while they're digging, is anything special about today? There used to be pirates that used to live out here. And uh, I dug a little hole back here, and lo and behold, uh, look what I found. Holy smoke. Dad got a little treasure, too. I should say. Tell me about the, the treasure. Well, you see, it's a 14.5 horse, 42 inch. Uh, <laughs> I thought I saw something shiny. Take it with your hands. Uh oh. Yeah, I see it. Whoa! Holy smoke. I can't believe is there anything in there? What? What? In the world? <laughs> Money? Look at the treasure. There's coins in there. Holy smoke. In our own yard. Boy, what a day. My husband. Tying me up? Yeah. Oh, no. A 
I've never met a man like him. Hi, man. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> we met at 20 years old, and three years later, we were married. I could have never imagined the adventure ahead. Well, you know, I think that you have to break the rules. Uh -huh, I think we did. <laughs> you, go to the uh -huh. you know anyone that's got a soccer goal in their yard? Have you ever seen one in someone's yard? No, no, I haven't. That's what I'm talking about. We started a family. Well, what do you know? Look who's on the bed. Is that Spencer in there? Spencer's in there. We can hear your heartbeat. There we go. Is that a beautiful boy? Space, but he's doing he was the best dad. <laughs> Whoa! Hey! <laughs> Playing a cat mouse game with Sam. He knew how to make oh, every yeah, moment Sam special. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Say bye! Bye, babe. I love you. Then, in the midst of a successful business career, Brian got promoted for direct sales here in Portland on Wednesday. Come on, son. <laughs> Jesus called him into full time it ministry. Is Brian Willie Brandt. Woo! We started gathering young people and never stopped. Because we have more kids in our house, we're actually concerned about the support rooms of the house holding these kids. We started a church together, circuit riders together. We sang together. And in the midst of raising a family, Obeying Jesus, leading ministry, he cared for me during 32 years of illness. He never stopped praying and believing for my healing. In 2019 at the Send in Orlando, he saw God do the impossible. He healed your wife. You taught us too many things to count. How to live in freedom. Move forward with an unoffended heart. Stand in unwavering faith. How to advance in the courage of Christ. Be a radical servant. And you never stopped calling all of us to step into the fullness of who God called us to be. And into His great harvest field. This is a new season and we're at the edge of it and God is stirring your heart as I speak tonight and it's the Holy Spirit saying there is a call on your life. Who are you going to be? Why are you here? What is your purpose? Is it as little as you think? It is not. It is as great as the Lord has said and you're wrestling with God like Jacob over who you are and I'm telling you the wrestling match has got to stop. You must seize your identity that is found in the scriptures of who you were meant to be. Would you surrender to the truth and accept your calling? Would you surrender to the truth and accept your calling? What is my calling? Focus on following Christ. He's leading you into your calling.
Wow, there's no easy way to follow that. <laughs> Why don't you stand with me as we, uh, I don't know if today was more of a memorial service or more of a revival service. <laughs> I think it was a little bit of both. But I think the best way to end, would you put your hands on the shoulders of people on both sides of you? Brian loved family prayer moments. <laughs> Can we just pray? Can we end in a chorus of prayer that everything that we have fought for, dreamt for, prayed for would be walked out because of the legacy that's carried in this room? Can we end by lifting our voices together just that these prayers and this faith that's been imparted to us would be carried so that millions and millions would hear the good news of Jesus, so that campuses all across America and the nations would be touched by the glory of God, so that high schools would be touched and 16-year-olds would know their identity in Christ, to pray that 200,000 new missionaries would launch all over the world and that we in this room would have the great privilege of carrying that legacy forward. Can we just end in a family prayer time? This legacy would march forward and this baton would be carried all over the earth. Let's just do that. Let's pray our own words, our own way. Father, give us a fresh burden for souls today. Give us a fresh burden for souls, God. We pray that that impartation of faith would fall in this room today. Everything that this man represented in our lives, God, would you release that impartation today over the hundreds gathered, over the hundreds online, over the thousands that have been packed over the years. We ask today, release an impartation of faith. There is nothing possible. All of your promises are sure, God. So we stand in faith today, Lord, both in the grief and in the glory of this man's life. And we declare 80 million salvation in America, God. 200,000 missionaries across the earth, God. Family over ministry, God. And all of it done in extravagant, laid down love for you, Jesus, with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let it go forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, in closing, um, we, have a, uh, we have a way that we can all respond. There's a website, I think, that we're going to show the site for here, brianbrent.com. And this was created so special that we're able to end this way that you could share a story of impact on that website and uh, some way that Brian marked your life so special to be able to read those together. And so I encourage you to take a moment to do that. Those watching online, take a moment to do that. These are the stories that brings so much honor to the life that he lived. And number two is the, the family and the kind of the broader community put together like our favorite list of Brian's teachings. And that list is long. And we couldn't agree on all of them, but literally the, the text train was hilarious as we began to remember some of our favorite moments when Brian fed a butterfly with graham crackers and teaching the unoffendable heart and on and on it went. But those curated list of our favorite moments is on that website. And then this is one of the greatest ways we could possibly end is that though Brian has run his race, Christie's race has really just begun. And the, the, I, I truly believe we will be dumbfounded at the anointing that this woman is going to walk in in the years to come. The leadership, the calling on her life, all the words, all the prophecies, they've really just begun. And we have the great privilege I already shared from the, for Holly and I. We stand with the Brent family the same way we stood with Brian. We have an opportunity. Christy is a missionary. 
And Christy has a missionary calling on her life, decades of fruitful missionary living. And on that website, you have the opportunity to become a part of the Christy Brent team. And I don't know about you, but I want to be the number one fan on that team. And so we, this was our decision that we have the opportunity to, to raise Christy's support for the decades ahead. Could be one-time gifts, could be monthly, but what an appropriate way to end. There's nothing Brian cared more about than that Christy was set up for the future. And this isn't just benevolence. This is a radical calling on one of the greatest women that we have ever known and the countless lives that will be impacted through her. And so that, you have an opportunity to do that as well on the website. Guys, we have the rest of the afternoon here just to hug each other, high-five each other, tell each other stories, love each other. And uh, there's a reception outside. We just ask that uh, for the reception that you would eat kind of in the table and chairs area, not on the brick. The church asks us to do that. And so let's just take the, the rest of this time together to celebrate, to love each other, to inspire each other, and uh, love you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all those that flew here for this moment. Thank you for all of those that watched online. This is maybe one of the greatest family reunions I've ever been able to be a part of. So we love you. Have an amazing afternoon.